Hello, hackers. Welcome back to Poem College. This is the um, fourth video in the return oriented programming module. We're going to be talking about complications you run into when ROPing. All right. Um, I'm just going to go through a bunch of issues, talk about how this um, impacts you and uh, how you might um, bypass these issues. Um, issue number one, limited stack control, right? Sometimes your amount that you can overflow is actually fairly low. Maybe you can just overflow the return address and that's all you get. Um, this happens a lot. There are several ways to deal with it. One way to deal with it is, um, uh, let me actually go through that. All right. So why might this occur? One way, uh, reason it could occur is that there's still limited overflow and off by one that lets you in, in let's say an eight, uh, uh, a, a, an array of eight byte elements that lets you overwrite just the return address. Or uh, maybe you can't input any null bytes. So then, you know, when you input the, great, uh, the most significant bytes of an address on AMD64, they're uh, null uh, for the most part, um, then your overflow ends. And then you can only trigger one gadget, right? Um, turns out you can win with uh, just one gadget. And um, there are several ways to do it. One way is to um, trigger what is called an, a magic gadget. When you call the system library call, uh, you set up a call to execv bin sh dash c and whatever command you set uh, to system. If you are lucky and you jump partway into system, you could trigger execv bin sh, right? And it actually works. This is called the magic gadget. There are tools. Um, one of them is on my CTF tools uh, repository that will find the uh, address of these gadgets for you. Um, the problem is that these gadgets have uh, requirements on um, what, how the, the state should look like, what RAX or RSI or RDI need to um, uh, be, for example, RDX might need to be null so that this environment can, can be passed in um, as null and um, then, you know, the exec v syscall will succeed. Um, so it's not always uh, super simple. Um, and uh, sometimes it's easier to just try jumping into, you know, every different offset of um, system on your uh, machine in libc and see what happens. For example, you might be able to execute some random thing that just executes some file and then you can, you know, put something uh, in that file. You've done this again in the shell coding module where you were able to execv one letter. But of course, by creating a, a, a program with that one letter name, you were able to execute it. Um, uh, just an example to think about in terms of a magic gadget. Of course, the magic gadget is often um, the go-to thing because um, uh, people want a shell. People want to run system, right? You want the flag. You don't necessarily need to run system. CHO is great for you um, and, and a whole lot of other things, right? Um, in fact, system is bad because bin sh will drop privileges by default. So what you want to do is um, find a magic gadget that works for you. That magic gadget might be part way into the CHO library call, for example. All right, issue two, um, address space layout randomization. This actually has to do also with um, uh, issue one, where you can only do one gadget. Uh, I'll talk about why. Um, if you don't know where anything is in memory, you can't write intelligent return addresses. It just won't work, right? Um, but you've already seen this problem. You've seen this in baby mem, and you solved it with a partial return pointer overwrite, and you can do the same thing here. 
You can overwrite just the lowest bits of the return address or the lowest uh, two bytes. You have a one in 16 chance of surviving that, or the program does when it returns. And you can overwrite it to point somewhere interesting. Often, what you want to do is overwrite it to loop the program back to the beginning, maybe with a slightly corrupted state, so that when it takes certain actions, um, later on, it'll start corrupting more and more and more. Um, looping a program uh, is similar to the repeat backdoor in BabyMem that you used to um, retrieve information about the, the software. Um, as long as you can keep the program alive, your chance that you can get it to do what you want it to do, stay non-zero, right? The longer you can loop the program, loop it again, loop it again, try to leak information little by little, um, the, the better off you are. Um, the other, so that's one way of, of kind of starting to deal um, with ASLR. Um, if, by the way, you are returning from main, so the return address is into libc start main, which is in libc, with a partial return pointer override, you might be able to hit a magic gadget that will do um, what you want it to do for you. Um, let me uh, hide the camera. The other way, of course, to work around ASLR is a, a disclosure address space uh, or, or uh, an information disclosure that will leak out an address to you. But that's very situational, um, not as, as general. Uh, of course, workaround one isn't so general either. Workaround one, this idea of looping the program also um, uh, works for uh, a limited uh, stack write. Uh, the other thing that works for a limited stack write that we talked about in the last video is a stack pivot. You use your single gadget, if you only had to get one gadget to pivot the stack to, um, for example, exchange RSP and RAX, and RAX might point to an input buffer that you control more of. Another thing you could do is loop the program, not quite to the beginning, but to um, the setup of the read function call. Uh, but now, because you've corrupted some part of the state, the um, amount that it reads is bigger, right? Um, and then you can read in a larger uh, wrap chain and carry out your attack. Um, okay, anyways, ASLR is a problem. There are these little ways that you can kind of still survive with it, but realistically, um, it is uh, not good. Uh, and you will likely need a uh, memory disclosure somehow to get by it. Um, next issue, stack canaries. These are brutal against ROP. ROP requires a return pointer overwrite, um, which often requires an overwriting of the stack canary. You'll need to figure out a way to bypass it, uh, similar to how you did in baby mem, right? There's no silver bullet. Stack canaries are extremely effective. Um, just keep those in mind. Um, there are also um, interesting exotic academic solutions that have been attempted to solve ROP, um, to, to make ROP uh, less uh, powerful, right? Um, these solutions um, range from uh, removing ROP gadgets. Um, so, you know, making sure that functions don't have you know, pop, pop uh, R, RDI, RET, right? But that, those are really onerous. Um, I have never seen them actually deployed outside of academic papers. And even the academic papers um, don't eliminate all ROB gadgets. And you don't actually need that many ROB gadgets to carry off a successful attack. Um, you can try to detect when a ROP attack is happening. You say, okay, that's fine. We'll have a ROP attack, but when a syscall occurs, you go through the stack and see um, uh, what uh, what it looks like if it looks like a ROP attack, or you will um, keep a log. Um, you look at the processor instruction log and see how many rats were executed in the last 100 instructions, and you say, okay, this looks like ROP, and then kill the program. This is actually deployed in practice. In Windows, for example, Windows protects itself against ROP using this K-bouncer technique. Um, 
it's used, but it's bypassable, right? If you have enough control or a program to be comfortably ropping, then you can likely uh, stealth yourself. You can create a ROP chain that is, uh, tries to hide the fact that it's a ROP chain by running other benign code, et cetera, et cetera, right? And in the end, uh, fools the system into thinking that ROP isn't happening. Um, and then there's this category of academic solutions called control flow integrity. Um, control flow integrity was proposed over a decade ago now um, by uh, a bunch of researchers, many of whom are still active in the field, um, in a paper called Control Flow Integrity. The core idea is that for any um, indirect jump, any return, any um, call uh, that um, you know takes a register as an argument, an indirect jump, something that an attacker could control, um, we put in some code to make sure that the target of that jump at runtime is what it's supposed to be. Of course, you don't know the target. Um, it, it's, it's hard to know at runtime what all the targets are supposed to be. Code is very complex, but you do your best, right? And this spawned a whole arms race of techniques that try to prevent ROP and techniques that try to uh, bypass techniques that try to prevent ROP. Um, it was it, it was a wild time. This is around uh, 2015, 2016. It is every other academic paper coming out was about either preventing ROP or um, preventing the prevention of ROP. It was insane. And we had tons of techniques. We had block oriented programming. And this is okay, we can we can ROP, but on a block level, like on, on, on a, a very high level of instructions, uh, kind of like what we did in our uh, example intro in the beginning. Say, okay, you take these these huge chunks of the program and by carefully crafting the state and, and, and uh, transitions between them instead of little gadgets, we can build um, our attack out of large parts of the program to bypass certain techniques. In fact, these large parts of the program could even start on uh, valid targets for indirect control flow transfers. Um, there was jump-oriented programming. It says we just don't use returns. Right, we use indirect jumps instead. This bypasses stuff like K-Bouncer, Rob Packer, and so forth. These sort of system level, let's let people rob, but then detect when they try to make syscalls. Um, there's call-oriented programs, SIG return, all sorts of, of you know, crazy ROP um, uh, variants that have come up. Data-oriented program is kind of cool. It says, all right, instead of hijacking any control flow at all, let's just carefully corrupt the program's data so that um, we can puppet the program. Of course, this depends on what the program does and uh, whether you can do that or not, but you can imagine that um, if the program you're attacking is Bash or B, you know, BinSH, then by corrupting its data, you can get it to do anything you want on your behalf um, because it is a command processor. It'll process that data and then execute commands. All right, control flow integrity was recently made an actual reality. Up until now, all of these academic um, techniques for control flow integrity, against control flow integrity, for the most part, were not really used. Sometimes they'd be deployed in Windows, but, but bypassable and so forth. Um, recently, and I mean very recently, September 2020, Intel released <clears throat> a series of new processors that has CET, Control Flow Enforcement Technology. What does this mean? Um, it means, in terms of relevance for us, CET adds the end BR64 instruction. This likely sounds familiar to you. If we, uh, if you opt dump any recently compiled binary, for example, on Ubuntu 2004, at the beginning of every function is this end BR instruction. End BR tells the processor, any processor enabled uh, that has CET enabled, tells that processor, hey, this is a valid target of a indirect control flow transfer. And the processor makes sure that when you do a ret, the next instruction you execute is end BR. Otherwise it kills the program. Um, on the processors without CET, those instructions simply do nothing. 
They're on, they're literally a no-op. Um, and so what uh, this does is make ROP a lot harder. You can no longer, you know, as soon as these uh, processors become widely adopted, you'll no longer be able to chain these little gadgets together. You really have to chain whole functions or pieces of functions that are valid targets for um, these control flow transfers. It's going to be tricky. It won't block ROP. There's still advanced techniques like block-oriented programming that will be viable, but it'll uh, complicate their exploitation quite a lot. Um, in fact, I'll probably have to completely redo this module within a couple of years as these uh, uh, processors become commonplace, or at least augment the module. It'll be very interesting to see. Um, all right. The final ultimate challenge, what if you don't have anything? You're, you don't know where things are, ASLR is on, but you also don't even know what the program is that you're exploiting, right? Turns out you can hack completely blind and you have done much of this, right? The, the intuition, as you well know from baby mem, that things are only randomized at program start. In the memory error module, in the final level, you broke a program piece by piece because it kept forking at every request. So the program would start up, it would fork off a request handler, and you would interact with it. You would overflow the canary and you would overflow it with uh, one and it would crash. You overflow it with two and it would crash. Eventually, you would get that first byte correct. It won't crash. And then you go on to the second byte. You can brute force the canary, the return address, um, and, and the entire stack, byte by byte, to leak out um, all control flow relevant information. Um, you did that in baby mem. And then in baby rev, if you remember the last level, you did a blind attack against a randomized Yan85 instruction set that you didn't have the mapping for. And you did that by sending some input and waiting for a survival signal, interpreting that and saying, okay, what I sent must have been an immediate instruction. You could do the same thing on this weird machine of ROP, right? So once you byte by byte leak out ASLR uh, or the stack canary, everything that you need, then you can start doing this crazy weird machine introspection of blindly leaking out um, in the same way that you leaked out Yan85, a... Um, uh, a way to understand what parts of the program do what. All you really need to do is find the right system call or some right functionality that will then let you leak out the program and then let you solve it. Um, this technique is called Blind ROP. It was published um, by Andrea Bitao in 2014. Unfortunately, Andrea, um, in the last couple of years, died in a motorcycle accident, uh, but the technique um, that he created was incredible. And um, the talk was amazing. I'm not sure if it's recorded somewhere, um, but it was really cool. He, on stage, you know, ran a um, fully patched, up-to-date uh, version of Apache, or Nginx, I don't remember, some web server, um, except for with one vulnerability, which was a control flow, um, a, a, a stack overflow um, that allowed control flow hijacking. And then he used blind ROP to leak out not just ASLR um, and the canary, but also the whole binary and then exploit it. It was very cool to see, uh, very cool presentation. Um, all right, so those are some complications, like very difficult complications you might run into um, when you are uh, on your ROPing adventures. Hopefully, this has um, equipped you to deal with them. Good luck.